Everyone who has lived in post-communist Intermarium knows there is a faction of people who express genuine nostalgia for the totalitarian era that ended somewhere between 1988 and 1991, depending on the country. In some areas it even has specific names such as Yugo Nostalgia for those who yearn for the bygone days of the Titoist Empire. Others don't have a specific name, but the word Nostalgia is the common denominator. And it's not by accident, albeit a lot harder to empathize with. Now, when it comes to large numbers, having a few people believing something weird or outright false is to be expected. But the so-called nostalgia for communism stands out because the segments of the populations are not negligible. Up until about five years ago, in some countries, that segment was large enough to influence or even decide the outcome of national elections. Also, nostalgia for the Marxist-Leninist era is sometimes present even within individuals who themselves broke the law in order to escape the regime. I've met a few of those in the United States, Israel, Sweden or the Netherlands. Individuals born and raised in the Soviet Union or in a Warsaw Pact country who broke the law in order to emigrate and get political asylum and who for some reason manifest nostalgia for the thing they've run away from decades after that thing doesn't even exist anymore. Which means that if their nostalgia is for the home country itself rather than the regime, that could be satisfied by simply moving back. Now admittedly, some of them did just that and were happy with the choice. But the discussion is about those who didn't, or did and are not happy with the choice. So who are the nostalgics? Why do they still exist? And what about those who didn't live in those times and yet still manifest nostalgia? Let's explore! Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so this video may get longer than I intend to because this is a topic that really pisses me off from time to time and it's also a topic that I've studied, well, quite frankly, more than I should have. <laughs> So, <clears throat> to prevent it from going really long, I'll do what I usually do, which is to make a structure and try to follow it. Also, to make this video more interesting, I will superimpose over my boring face some footage from Communist Romania, just to drive the point home about what these people are nostalgic for. I would introduce the footage from other ex-communist countries too, but sadly many countries have chosen the restrictive copyright over historical documents like these, so no dice. So, for the purposes of this talk, the presentation is divided as follows. Uh, one, nostalgics who did get to see the era they're yearning for. So here I would count anyone born earlier than 1980. Now sure, you can argue that you remember things from the age of 5, but really, uh, most people who were under the age of 10 at the fall of communism didn't really understand what was going on. Sure, there are exceptions, but you get the point. Number two, nostalgics who didn't live through communism, but did get through the transition period. So here there would be people born between 1980 and let's say 1995. I'll explain the li why the limits uh, a bit further, a bit later. Number three, nostalgics who have zero e uh, personal experience. This would be anyone born after 1995 who came of age in a period of unimaginable prosperity in the ex-communist world. Number four, political operatives, pseudo-intellectuals and other shills and actors who, regardless of age, LARP as nostalgics for entirely different reasons. And finally, number five, some conclusions. Now I'm basically creating these categories 
not just to avoid making a two-hour rant about this, but also because oftentimes analysts, pundits, authors, academics, and anyone else opining on this tends to lump nostalgics as one group and analyze them in bulk. Now, while sometimes that's useful, for instance when tracking the share of the vote by individuals who hold this particular view, it becomes detrimental when trying to understand why they exist and why they believe what they believe and how they ended up believing that in the first place. Among my generation, and especially many of the younger ones, the tendency is to simply say they're all stupid and dumb. Well, it's certainly true that many of them are indeed quite dumb, but many aren't, or are selectively dumb, if you want. But why is that? Well, I don't pretend to know all the answers, but I do know some of them. So let's start with the first category, the nostalgics who did get to see and be at least in part aware of the era they are now yearning for. So this would be people born before 1980. So in this particular well, age group of nostalgics, we have people who not only lived through the nagging that used to go on in schools or having been fed uh, Ceausescu or Enver Hoxha or Stalin or Lenin pictures in their school textbooks. No, no, no. In this age group, we have people who already had the opportunity to start climbing up the ranks in the regime. I mean, once you became a pioneer, it was at least in part up to you whether you wanted to become ingratiated with the political power or not. Also, this age group did get to see the communist period both at its worst and at its so-called best. For instance, in Romania, the best period, economically speaking, was sometime between late 1960s and 1978-ish. A bit after March, uh, the March 4, 1977 earthquake, things started going really bad, culminating with the Venezuela tier type of starvation that plagues the period between 1980 and all the way till the end of the regime. In Hungary, it was the other way around. The best period was the 1980s and the worst came slightly before that. Their dictator, Janos Kada, uh, started out as a moderate Stalinist, if you can believe such thing can exist, and gradually turned to what Hung Hungarians unironically call Gulash Communism, or Gulash Communism, which in practice meant slightly less secret police, less Gulag, more apparent freedom of speech, but also more spying on one's own citizens, more economic freedom than the Marxist-Leninist norm, but, slight, but strict, um, highly strict price controls, more cultural freedom, especially when compared to Romania, but also no traveling, just like in Romania, uh, and of course, no elections and definitely no opportunity to disagree with the project outright. These reforms started technically in 1956, but the de facto after 1965, uh, well, these uh, uh, reforms, they led to things getting slightly better, and the 1980s were in many ways the best that communism had to offer to Hungary. Mind you, it was still terrible, but I'm trying to, here to make you see things through the perspective of the nostalgics. In Poland, it was a mix between the previous two examples, the Poles going more than once through this cycle between repression and reform. The point is that anyone born before 1980 got to see at least a bit of both the worst and the best of communism. So that's one aspect. Then there is the aspect that most uh, of these people uh, were at the prime of their revolutionary age when the regime fell apart. When you're 20 or 25 or even 30, the likelihood of falling for utopian expectations is a lot higher than after the age of 30. This is, again, uh, normal. And this age group in, is particularly relevant in Romania, where this constitutes a huge generation, numerically speaking, born following Ceausescu's decree to ban abortion, as well as the subsequent uh, consequences that, uh, of that decree, decree that resulted in a de facto ban of virtually all contraceptives, too. Many commentators did notice that most of those uh, who really wanted Ceausescu dead were the children who would not have otherwise been born in the first place had it not been for his own policies. 
And in a way, that's true. I mean, who says history doesn't have a sense of humor? Anyway. Because the nostalgics from this age group had already, for the most part, came of age by the fall of communism, they developed a certain perspective, which was shaped by factors that were not exactly in, under their control. And this is consistently observed in every single ex-communist country except Russia, where the nostalgia phenomenon is a lot more complicated. Maybe I'll make a separate video on that some other time. I mean, there are legitimate nostalgics for the Gulag period. I mean, speaking of which, send me to the Gulag. <laughs> anyway, back on topic. So, for starters, these people never got an explanation at their level for what had just happened when communism fell. And the key phrase here is at their level, and by that I don't imply they were necessarily stupid, though of course some of them were, but I do imply that the explanations offered in the public space in the weeks and months after the ousting of communism were insufficient, both quantitatively, quantitatively and qualitatively speaking. Dr. Dominik Bartmanski, a Berlin sociologist and himself with heavy nostalgic tendencies, writes about this in a very long article called Successful Icons of Failed Time, Rethinking Post-Communist Nostalgia, published about a decade ago or so in Acta Sociologica, which is one of the few sociology journals that publishes only 80% trash, as opposed to 99.9% .9 trash, which is the absolute norm in sociology journals. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Mr. Bartmanski explains better and in fewer words than I can, so longish quote, and of course links in the low bar to read it in its entirety should you want to, uh, because he also cites a lot of tertiary research on the topic which you could follow if you want to go full autistic on this topic. So, uh, quote, post-communism meant enormous uncertainty, hence people dwelt on grandiose terms such as return to Europe or return to reality. Only this much uh, seemed certain. Transformation represented macroliminality, a rite of passage from the profane qualities of Eastern communism to the sacred values of Western order. This collective sentiment was understandable given the bleak reality of the ossified Soviet bloc, whose societies were comparatively exhausted and craved release from an all too obvious political cul de sac. In the GDR, as, uh, as if uh, to insult an already injured country, Erik Honecker uh, continued to say until the very end that neither ox nor donkey will stop the progress of socialism. He was right, his own people would stop it. As the regime imploded and the reunification of Germany materialized within a year, Germans eagerly agreed to consign a failed socialist experiment to the dustbin of history. Poles were committed to do the same. This vision was epitomized by Tadeusz Mazowiecki's insistence that we draw a thick line between the past and the present and bring Poland back into the stream of human progress. That was a direct quote. Yet before long, social scientists began to notice the distinctly unrealistic component of this epochal return to reality. They discerned heavily utopian tendencies, especially with regard to capitalism and democracy, whose natural link to the free market was assumed. As the first years of transformation passed, it was becoming clear that impossibly high hopes were placed in free market economies. The citizens of the new Europe nursed many illusions after the breakthrough of 1989. Like every utopian belief, this one was prone to transmogrify into disenchanted chagrin when confronted with mundane, protracted birth pangs of the new order it aspired to. Given the extraordinary pragmatism of the Velvet Revolutions, the coming of various utopian moods may have appeared unlikely, yet such moods were neither illogical nor unparalleled. They certainly would not astonish scholars well versed in history and cultural anthropology. 
As some of the most prominent among them noted, every revolution needs social energies, which only broadly exaggerated expectations can mobilize, and in every revolution these hopes must be disproportionately great in relation to the outcome. Every re revolution thus creates a great mass of disappointments. The revolutions of 1989 were no different. The transformations they instigated were bound to be arduous. The road to rediscovering liberalism quickly turned out to be bumpy. In fact, to some they turned out so derailing that they informed conspicuous efforts to re-signify the revolutionary distribution of the sacred and profane that seemed taken for granted only a few years earlier. This condition was understood by historians as succumbing to the anomie that is always attributed to those suffering from the early stages of harsh capitalism. In the GDR, the process of growing skepticism towards new conditions was further exacerbated by what many described as the colonization of the East by the West. The division of Germany created a comparative context from which, upon the fall of the wall, the East emerged as the impoverished loser. The transitional unification presented it as the unequivocal and thus disconcerting or even humiliating fact. In other countries of the region, that precise that dynamic was obviously missing. Well, that's where you're wrong, Mr. Sociologist. But its cultural equivalents existed there too. In all of them, the first f uh, phases of transformation were more like cleaning Augean stables than anything else. I love the Hercules reference. <laughs> it's kind of true. Anyway, quote. They meant being confronted not only with the first te temples of Western capitalism, but also with pervasive Leninist legacies, as well as with the fact that these legacies could not simply be wished away in one fell swoop. They were part and parcel of the existential experience and determined memories, affinities, loyalties and identities. Not realizing this on the part of some reformers and citizens was yet another symptom of post-revolutionary utopianism. As the post-revolutionary disenchantment settled in, the worry about distinct psychological issues was thematized. Historians noted the possibility that the East Germans might harbor a sense of loss and resentment when confronted with transformations regardless of economic performance. All these apprehensions proved prescient. Collective feelings of disappointment, loss or even resentment surfaced and took a life on their own. By the mid-1990s, uh, such countries as Poland or Hungary saw the former communists enter parliaments in democratic elections. In the GDR, the communists managed to retain support of some constituencies in Berlin and elsewhere. These political tendencies were coeval with what appeared to be a rising tide of reminiscing about the communist reality jettisoned only several years earlier. One may have felt entitled to connect all these phenomena and conclude within only a few years disillusionment was replacing high expectations. The, feeling, the first signs of what was called Ostalgi appeared nostalgia for familiar shabby GDR. The older generation began to cleanse its memory of the oppressive aspects of the GDR and remember gratefully the parochial privacy, slowness and predictability of its so-called socialist life. In short, a link was being established between ca capitalist transitional hardships and communist nostalgic commitments. Just as the loathing of communism occasioned uh, utopian infatuation with free society, so the subsequent dispelling of some liberal theories in transitional practice seemed to inspire the rise of nostalgia. In the GDR, the very playfulness of the word Ostalgie, the German portmanteau that literally means nostalgia for the East, could stand for the phenomenon's authenticity and strength. Its iconic representations contributed to the making of post-communism as a distinct cultural condition, a kind of genuine cultural post-condition." Okay, the author, <clears throat> really this author is a bit pompous with words here, but he's not fundamentally wrong. And what he des describes for the former uh, DDR absolutely applies to what I have observed in post-communist period uh, in Romania, as well as what I have observed and studied in the rest of the Intermarium. A lot of those who took part in the revolution quite literally expected things to magically turn around in maybe a year or even faster. <laughs> 
These are the people to whom nobody explained that 10 years of state-sponsored starvation and utterly dysfunctional economy, like we had in Romania in the 80s, simply cannot be fixed in a year, and no, not even in a five years, devised by the wisest. On top of that, there is also the issue that, in my opinion, is much more evident in Hungary and Romania than in Slovakia or Poland, namely that in free elections the majority of the people had no idea what to do with them. I mean, in Hungary, the MSP, which is officially the heir of the Marxist-Leninist party, outright won the elections in 1994, and while it lost the first free elections, it rebounded and remained the most important political party until 2010 and even a bit afterwards. As corrupt and as uh, um, uh, problematic as I know many of you all see him, Fidesz in general and Viktor Orban personally can though be credited for killing the Marxist-Leninists politically. Hey, no hate, just facts. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Same, things, same thing here in Romania, the Social Democrats won the first free elections by a huge margin and although they lost in 1996, they remained the most important political force all the way till 2004 and maintained their status as the political force you simply cannot ignore until basically the present day. Unlike Czechia or Poland, there was no broad agreement on how to proceed after the regime change. And this is noticeable to this day in, term, uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic performance and general development. And even in Poland, who definitely managed the transition uh, the best out of all of the uh, Warsaw Pact countries, even there the phenomena uh, described by uh, Dr. Barmanski can be noticed. Older subscribers may remember that in one of the interviews I published from Poland, we did mention a few encounters with nostalgics who, with a straight face, will tell you that Warsaw of today is worse off than Warsaw of 1980s. Now, that's false by absolutely all metrics, but it's not a lie. That is to say, those people seriously believe that rather than engaging in intentional lying. And this is happening because of the psychological process described correctly by Dr. Barmanski. Once this appointment settles in, enough people, though by no means all or even a majority, but enough people do start the slow but consistent process of purging their bad memories of the previous era and reconstructing a narrative that encompasses bits of reality as well as feelings unique to their own, which may or may not have been real at the time, and a lot of rich imagination, or if you prefer, suspension of reason. That's the best way I can explain why a shockingly high amount of, uh, well, boomers <laughs> uh, seriously believe, referring to communist Romania, that people were more calm back then, or that crime wasn't an issue, when in reality the exact opposite is true. People were definitely not more calm when they had to physically fight in order to get enough food to get by for the day, and those who don't believe me are advised to uh, dig a lot through this channel, uh, because back in 2015 I spent a lot of time translating memories from communism, articles written by, you know, well, I guess we can call them survivors, because it was, it was really a collective trauma. As for crime, the most charitable interpretation would be that, um, at least after 1990, it was legal to talk about it, uh, whereas in the 80s the regime would suppress crime statistics, and uh, especially suppress any discussion about serious crime, very violent crime. But again, that's me being too charitable. More realistically, um, Let's, let's stick with the example from Romania. 1980 Romania and 2020 Romania might as well be not just on different planets, but in entirely different galaxies in terms of uh, crime rate and overall violence. And the same is true for almost all ex-communist countries, and certainly true for those in the Intermarium. For instance, in the Global Peace Index, which includes likelihood for violent demonstrations as well as crime rate, political terror and other aspects, the ex-communist countries ranked in uh, 2019 
uh, as follows. Slovenia is number 8 in the world, because it has no military, basically. Uh, Czechia number 11, Hungary, Slovakia and Romania from 21 to 24, with Germany sandwiched between them. Bulgaria 26th, Croatia, Croatia 28th, Estonia 37th, Lithuania 40. Uh, so, so it's not that bad. Now, sure. Uh, the Global Peace Index has a problem, namely that it is biased against countries that take their defense seriously. So alternatively, we could look at the safety ranking made by Global Finance magazine, which has a very strong emphasis on personal safety and is less biased against military spending. In that ranking, the ex-communist countries in the Intermarium are still roughly in the same order and grouped in the top 20% safest. Now, I did run the numbers, uh, just out of pure curiosity, on the Global Peace Index for 1988 using data that I was aware of and using their methodology, which is publicly available. It resulted in Romania, 1988 Romania being 110th, around China and Algeria on the table. <laughs> well, yeah, that sounded about right, actually. But it doesn't matter how many facts you throw at such people, because even if you do convince them that they're wrong, within five minutes, right in front of your eyes, will revert to the position, yeah, that may be true, but still we had a better life. Now, some harsher commentators have noted that these kinds of people long for the days when they could have an erection. <laughs> I mean, it's funny and harsh and in a way true, but it's really not just that. Because even this group has degrees. Now, surely yearning for the period when they were younger, that's understandable. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, because again, this group has degrees. I mean, the political conversation is usually focused on those who had connections in the old regime and adapted to post-communism and continue to wield uh, undue influence or continued to wield undue influence until they died, especially given that the uh, lustration efforts turned out to be, well, a joke for the most part, let's be real. But as I said, there are degrees. There is also the category that used to have connections and was unable to adapt to post-communism. And then there's the category that didn't have connections in communism but was an obedient slave and didn't, didn't even have the means to adapt to a higher degree of freedom. This is, in a way, analogous to what happened in the more distant past in the societies that freed the slaves without any reconstruction or compensation process or policies. Translation. Freedom is hard, man. <laughs> it is. Now, I happen to like it and regard its trade-offs as completely acceptable, even when those trade-offs uh, harm me personally. But it shouldn't be so surprising if others find it burdensome. On the contrary, it should be acknowledged and then their influence intentionally curbed. Because otherwise, those people will vote in totalitarianism right back without battling an eyelid. I'm just saying. One more thing that I need to say about this cat category, or on this category. I spent a lot of time on this one because it's the category that not only benefited from most research about it, but it is also the only category that is highly nuanced and can sometimes even get the benefit of the doubt. In the sense that for some minds, not necessarily limited, just slightly different, uh, differently constructed, it is perfectly reasonable to have a few percentage points uh, who simply aren't equipped to deal with such a radical transformation. And make no mistake, the transformation was indeed very profound and in virtually all aspects of life. I mean, let me put it this way. If I were to send a 20-year-old from today back into the times of my childhood, he or she could literally not navigate that world. And it's not just the technology, it's the whole structure that was entirely different then or is entirely different today. Overwhelmingly better today, yes, but also fundamentally different. The same is not true for the previous generation. A 20-year-old from 1995 in any ex-communist country would have been able to navigate the world of 1965 in the same country. Because by 1995 the transformation was still marginal and the 20-year-old would have been aware of the reflexes of the previous era. 
Now, I'm only mentioning this because way too many of not just my fellow citizens, but also younger citizens of other Intermarium countries simply don't realize just how much things changed. All right. Well, I could say more about this category really, but I really don't want to go for two hours. So let's go to the second category. Nostalgics who didn't really live through communism, but did get through the brunt of the entirety of the transition period. And for clarity, I chose to put this category of people born between 1980 and 1995. Other commentators put it between 1985 and 2000, but it really does depend on the country and also what exactly you want to illustrate and also about, uh, depends on how you define transition. So for instance, I define transition as the dilution of so many of the reflexes of the previous era to the point that they can reasonably be considered eradicated. This is a more sociological definition because once again, we're looking at collective minds here and on a civilizational scale. Because yes, the fall of communist regimes was the kind of monumental change that should be regarded as a, or at a, or on a civilizational scale. It wasn't just economics, as sadly too many authors want to reduce it to these days. Yes, economics matters and mattered quite a lot, uh, especially in the uprisings in Albania, Romania and the Soviet Union, but the results were much broader than that. Anyway, so this particular age group uh, either has foggy memories or outright no memories from the communist period. So almost everything they know or think they know from and about the communist period is through secondhand sources. So on one hand, a portion of the nostalgics in this age group are simply a product of the law of big numbers. In a group large enough, some people will end up being educated by peddlers of falsehoods. And there were, particularly in the late 1990s and throughout the 2000s, that is to say, when these people were growing up and coming of age, there were a lot of peddlers of falsehoods. From opportunistic politicians to sensationalist commentators masquerading as journalists and all the way to their own parents, it is quite common for many of the nostalgics of this group to have formed their views, at least in part, as a result of the stories told to them by their parents. And as explained in the previous chapter, their parents' generation had some legitimate reasons to turn out the way they did. So that's one aspect. A second aspect is that this generation born between 1980 and 1995 also got to see and live some really messed up things by current year standards. Sure, not equally in every country, but still, the, the trend is similar. I mean, some Western commentators, usually from the left, but quite a few from the right as well, complain, for instance, about the state violence inflicted by the Spanish police against uh, the Catalan traitors, or whatever the Greek police is doing whenever they're having protests, which their protests are pretty harsh, really. Bitches, when I was a kid, that wouldn't have even made the news or it would have made the news as a marginal kerfuffle. <laughs> I mean, think about it. The 1990s included multiple street violence incidents in almost every Intermarium country. Some really large and serious, like the 1997 Albanian Civil War. Others have more medium in intensity, like the three uh, minor strikes in 1990, as well as the one in 1991 and the one in 1999 in Romania and a lot of low-tier violence caused by, uh, mostly by organized crime. Now keep in mind that organized crime was a thing in communism too. It's just that it was mostly, for the most part, part of the party itself. When communism fell, organized crime got privatized too. <laughs> also notice my framing. I put organized crime and gang-related violence in the low-tier category. And I put the minor strikes of the 90s as of medium intensity, even though those particular events are now today on trial as crimes against humanity. And that's because, and I'm doing this because that was the standard in the 1990s. <laughs> 
And this generation, born between 1980 and 1995, saw all of this and started to ask around if this is all there is to the world. And that's how some of them ended up in contact with the whitewashed narratives about the alleged pureness of the communist societies, where in fact this violence and some of the misery was just intentionally hidden and or obfuscated by the system, while in the 1990s uh, and uh, also afterwards the press would uh, freely write about them. Okay, so this was me being friendly with the younger nostalgics. Now on to the less friendly part. This generation is also the first generation in a century to have experienced uninterrupted growth. While we can argue that in the 1990s the growth was slower than it could have been or should have been, the fact remains that by any metric, virtually all members of this generation not only are clearly better off now than their parents were when they were born, but throughout their lives uh, they experienced almost continuous growth and a near certainty that their lives could only improve generally speaking. Were there exceptions? Yes, of course, especially among the ranks of those who made irresponsible financial decisions. But what I found interesting is that the younger nostalgics rarely come from the ranks of those who failed, either as a result of their own incompetence or as a result of other factors. It's usually people who've done pretty good for themselves. I mean, last year I met a 35-year-old whose net worth was already in the six figures, well, maybe five figures when converted to US dollars, an income about 500% higher than the national median, um, a nice house he had paid cash for, and who was seriously trying to convince me that things were better in the previous era. I mean, really? The only reasonable explanation for these kinds of cases is the concept of luxury beliefs. Now, luxury beliefs are the fashion uh, these days uh, everywhere, both in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, North America. Luxury beliefs are just the latest fashion among the rich, who in the past used to flaunt their social status by showing off luxury good, goods, such as you know, a golden watch, a better piece of clothing, a faster car, etc., etc. And now they do it via flaunting luxury beliefs such as political correctness, globalism, feminism, white privilege, or in the case of young post-communist rich, nostalgia for communism. Luxury beliefs have the great advantage that they don't cost that much, unlike luxury goods which are expensive. Also, luxury beliefs have the great advantage that they can sometimes work for the benefit of the rich. Not always, but almost always. This is true again for almost any luxury belief, not just some of them. Uh, take feminism, for instance. Who bears the brunt for that? It's certainly not the rich, who still have the same marriage rate as 50 or 60 years ago, still live largely conservative lives and virtually never practice what they preach. The brunt is borne by the poor. Same goes with commie nostalgia. I mean, this kid that I was talking about slightly earlier um, moves his income through Estonia. Of course he does, that's the smart thing to do in his line of work. He also holds his wealth in multiple financial instruments in three countries and has a nice house that is just coincidentally located a few meters away from the closest locality, which means it's an unincorporated area, which means roughly zero property taxes. So most of his modest proposals of going back to some of the aspects of the communist era wouldn't affect him in the slightest, but most of his potential competitors in the future would be indeed affected. So yeah, that's one explanation. Call me nostalgia as a luxury belief. Okay. Enough with this, let's move to the third category, nostalgics who have zero personal experience, namely those born after 1995. Now this category shouldn't even matter in theory, since young people as a rule tend to believe all sorts of nonsense, right? I mean, it's like a surprise. Well, not really, for two reasons. First of all, because it's one thing to believe some commie nonsense as idealistic claptrap, 
and a whole different thing to believe that a return to a very real rendition of communism is preferable. And not just any real rendition, but the one tried very recently in your own society and whose negative effects, as well as legacies, can still be explored firsthand for free. You don't even have to go to a museum. The whole country is an open museum, in a way. So what I'm saying is that nostalgics younger than 25 can't simply be excused because they're young. Youth is not a good enough uh, excuse. Nor is stupidity or low IQ, really. Or at least not stupidity alone, let me put it this way. Because I've known individuals on the lower end of the IQ spectrum and the very young, not intellectually gifted of today want to be a welder or and take advantage of the labor shortage to make a lot of money without having to read complicated books. So there has to be something else. Well, that something else is a lot more complicated to discuss. Ah, damn it, the video is getting long. Anyway, <laughs> the thing is that this is a developing issue in a way, uh, and it's also pretty fluid. Let me explain. For instance, I remember a study published by the Soros Foundation in Romania. You can imagine it's a pretty old study from back in the days when Soros was honest about his presence. <laughs> Anyway, that study, I think it was from 2011, claimed that almost half of teenagers born after 1990 uh, thought that things were in 2011 worse than 25 years prior. One year later, someone else repeated the study with almost the same subjects, almost the same um, kids, essentially, and the same methodology, and the percentages were quite different, with no more than 10% holding the same opinion. So it's certainly the case that a lot of this is just typical defiant teenager behavior. By the same token, it's also certainly the case that the post-communist setup failed to at least inform the next generation about communism. Not to educate, I mean that's already very complicated, but just to at least inform. I mean really, it's very hard to explain that the number of teenagers that I meet who simply do not know that, for instance, you'd have to queue for five hours for a loaf of bread back in communism, and the number of teenagers who don't know these kinds of basic stuff is staggering. And there is a lot of blame to go around for this, of course. I mean, starting with politicians, continuing with various international organizations who discourage honest talk about communism in schools, and finishing with the teachers themselves who are oftentimes ideologically motivated, many of them being uh, outright Stalinists. And I wish I were joking or exaggerating. I mean, I really find it funny when some random young leftist, um, young Western leftist, comes around here to tell me, oh, but you don't understand the difference between socialism and communism, bitch. I actually drink coffee quite routinely with honest to God Stalinists. Trust me, I do understand. And some of them are teachers. <laughs> and this has to have had an effect on the existence of basically, how should we call them? Third generation nostalgics, I guess? Very few in numbers, yes, but shockingly radical. And to make things worse, very little study is given to this generation. Part of that is because the current institutions are leftist in and of themselves, and as a result of as a direct result of that, have very little interest in studying left-wing radicalization. But part of that is also indolence, really. The good news is that this generation spends a lot, of, a lot of time online and has perhaps the highest chance of getting out of that with the general countercultural flow, which happens to be anti-communist these days anyway. But be that as it may, it is still dangerous not to study this phenomenon uh, further. And I'll try to take a stab at it in the next chapter. So finally, fourth category, political operatives, pseudo-intellectuals, and other shills and actors who, regardless of age, live-action role-play as nostalgics for entirely different reasons. Now, when I put it in these words, it sounds sinister, and that's because some of them are indeed sinister, but not all and not always. For instance, one source of radicalization of the youth into commie nostalgic crap comes from various Sistema clubs, 
Система, otherwise known by its more smiley face name, uh, namely Russian martial arts, is basically the fighting techniques of the Spetsnaz or the Russian slash Soviet special forces. Now, learning Система is not a bad thing and most definitely does not make one a commie, just like learning Krav Maga doesn't make one a Zionist or learning Bujutsu makes one a samurai. However, some Sistema clubs do use commie nostalgic rhetoric to gather fans and customers. Do those clubs intend to create new commies? No, of course not, or at least not in most cases, they just want more customers. In the initiation into commie radicalization is an unintended consequence of using that particular marketing technique. And this example is not random, I mean I know at least uh, five individuals radicalized in this form at a club operated by, well, an ex-Soviet citizen. The operator of the club wasn't and isn't a communist, but found his clients through commie rhetoric. He didn't want it to stick, but it did. So there's that. Then there's the political operatives category, which has increased lately. Now, talking about this has been made difficult because of recent mainstream media hysteria and outright lies, but nevertheless, Russian subversion is a real phenomenon. And with the slow but steady rehabilitation of Stalin within Russia itself, political operatives that are friends of the Kremlin have slowly introduced, or maybe I should say reintroduced, commie nostalgia into their propaganda arsenal. It doesn't exactly stick for now, but you shouldn't be surprised if it will with some people in the near future. Remember, any message can find adherence provided that it is well propagandized and enough time passes and enough tenacity is put into the process. And this category is clearly acting for sinister reasons. And then there's the pseudo-intellectuals, whose motives are a lot harder to ascertain, as they can range from simple trolling or joking to narcissism and all the way up to sincerely held beliefs. But while the motives are hard to grasp, the behavior is easy to identify. These are people who quite literally LARP as nostalgics because their rhetoric rarely matches what you will find amongst legit nostalgics from the first uh, described in the first two chapters. In this category, you will also find those who will seriously try to give you numbers that allegedly show a regress when compared to the communist period. It's all an ugly caricature, really. And it's really hard to distinguish which of them are trolling. Over time, I got uh, to a more decently refined process, I guess I could call it, but I still get some false positives uh, on my trolling detector. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the and then there are the shills who usually larp as nostalgics for more mundane reasons such as to demoralize the opposition of a political party or simply to make a quick buck shills remember are a different species than a political operative in the sense that the shill is subordinate to the political operative <sighs> Yeah, I know, I know, I should have made a video about shills too. I will, eventually, I promise. <laughs> the practical politics category will be expanded further. Just patience, please. So yeah, basically this latter, uh, how should I call it, bulk category, is the one that is simply dishonest. They don't represent a real opinion that exists in society, they just use an existent narrative flow for tertiary projects that may not even be related with the, the left in any way. I mean, I am aware of at least two right-wing projects who successfully used commie nostalgic rhetoric uh, through its lower shills in order to demoralize the voters of their opposition. Of course, I won't give you the names in public, uh, because I kind of like that tool and would like to keep it available. I mean, who knows, maybe it will work in the future too. <laughs> but no, seriously, <clears throat> differentiating between these categories is important 
because otherwise we risk lumping together the LARPers with real-life fellow citizens who, while they're still wrong, may have a very human or a more human reason for ending up believing something wrong. And understanding this difference also helps you from uh, uh, getting annoyed unnecessarily. Because yes, I know sometimes nostalgics can be really bloody annoying, though the amount uh, and they, they're annoying through the amount of um, how should I call it? the amount of nonsense that they spew. But if you understand where he or she is coming from, it makes it easy to well to move along. Basically, there's no way you argue with that. All right. Finally, number five. Some conclusions. First of all, as always, a friendly reminder, I don't pretend to know everything about everything, but I do know that people being wrong is something that is consistent to the human condition. This is something you should bear in mind next time you want to explode with anger when you stumble upon yet another nostalgic. It helps dealing with the situation easier, really. Secondly, while envy-driven totalist ideation, otherwise known as leftism, will likely never go away from the human experience, the specific phenomenon of commie nostalgia is time-limited. Or in a more cynical view, uh, more, uh, society progresses one funeral at a time, to paraphrase another extreme leftist. Uh, his name was Albert Einstein. In other words, <clears throat> the very old nostalgics will be gone in a few short years. The 1960s generation will be gone from relevance by 2035 at the latest and gone entirely by the middle of the century. Very young nostalgics seem to get cured pretty fast, so reasonably speaking, this will be a much smaller problem in just 10 years. And it already is a much smaller problem today than it was 10 years ago. In fact, 10 years ago, <clears throat> randomly stumbling upon commie nostalgic content on the internet was very common. Today, mm, today you kind of have to specifically look for it. What's important here is to understand the psychological process behind it, because that's a process that is consistent with any kind of change. And future generations would be strongly advised to take this into consideration when discussing change or transition, regardless of the change or transition being discussed. Uh, the mental processes themselves are roughly the same, regardless of whether the change is for the better or for the worse. Or even if the change is not clearly worse or better, just fundamentally different. Revolutionary change has trade-offs, regardless of the moral value ascribed to that change. <clears throat> And while it is true that the consequences are less severe when the change is overwhelmingly and obviously for the better, like it was the case with the 1989 falls of communism in the Intermarium, it is still very wise to keep this aspect in mind. After all, if our ideas eventually win, we, as in yes, we personally and also our children, will be among those to implement the reform which by the time may end up being a bit revolutionary. So we'd better understand this mechanism and have an answer to it. It may still not be enough to break the cycle, but it may end up making the issue easier. I'm just saying. So yeah, what do you all think? First of all, what did I miss? Because I'm sure I did miss something. Also, if you have experience with nostalgics, how do you manage the situation? How do you all view the whole situation? Let me know in the comments or via email or via the Discord server. And we should keep the conversation going on this a little bit. <clears throat> because while this may sound really abstract for those who don't have recent totalitarian experience, it is an issue that most will be hit by a lot faster than one imagines. In fact, I'm willing to already write the book about how things will develop in the DPRK once the regime fails. Uh, it won't be a 100% accurate, of course, but about two-thirds of the developments can be very accurately predicted now, before even the regime started uh, uh, trembling. So that's why this particular piece of knowledge is important. And we, <clears throat> So, yeah, no, that's it, enough. Uh, oh, oh my god, it's, it's already too long. So yeah, <clears throat> that, I'll stop here and um, maybe one day I'll make a video about nostalgia in Russia, because that's that's where the complicated stuff is. Uh, so yeah, 
And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your consistent and generous support. To help me combat nostalgia for terror, send me to the Gulag. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe. And um, I will see you all soon on the Freedom Alternative.